Our top stories tonight all seem to be old news. The blight of racism remains in the news this week. What seems to be a constant underlining issue has once again erupted and exploded through the surface like an active volcano. Bullying, not just an elementary playground issue. In days gone by, one bully's bluster could easily be overlooked. But in today's society, we're seeing how one mindless social media comment can go viral and remain on a person's record for a lifetime. Meanwhile, drug abuse continues to plague our communities, with hundreds of thousands of lives being impacted by the problem of addiction. What's to be done about an issue that is devastating rich and poor across our land? Certainly, the war on drugs requires more than a slogan. These reoccurring stories and more are our topics in this week's message series as we recognize our need for a reality check. Live on tape from our beautiful studios in Darden Prairie, welcome to Morning Star Church and Reality Check, featuring Robin Hunt and the Reality Check Band. Tonight's special guest, high school student and MC, MSC teen leadership member, Vanessa Onaha. Christian hip hop artist and worship leader Vance, get your praise on what? And special music brought by the evangelist Gloria Van. And now, here he is, your pastor and mine, Mike Schreiner! It's great to have those of you here. Did you see? Uh, did you see the sign, the billboard that we big put in billboard outside? sign the out billboard? there? Yeah. My goodness! We, uh, you notice that we don't have any. Uh, we don't actually have a sign on the billboard. It's just hey, kind of empty. You were not specific. You just said, "Lord, give me a sign." You didn't say, "Lord, give me a message." Well, we're we're looking for the. You know, we <laughs> we sometimes struggle to make a decision around right. here, so we're trying to do our research. Right. Uh, we've we've done a nationwide search, and we found we've narrowed it down to two the top two kind of messages for our billboard. Okay. And uh, the first is this one, <laughs> God wants spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. Uh, <laughs> hmm. We've met a few religious we, nuts. Yes, yeah. I think there yeah. are a few within spitting distance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing personal, Martin. Uh, easy now. Okay, here's the second one. Here's the second one. I thought this was good. Stop, drop, and roll does not work in hell. Okay. It's true. I wouldn't know. It's true. It's a little it's a little aggressive. Yes, it is. It's a little aggressive. It doesn't sound morning star-ish. Well, how about this one? Actually, right. we, we scrapped the first two. We, we went okay. back to the drawing board. Here's what we came up with. Uh, wow. Everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. Anything's possible. You yeah. like that? You like that? Dang right. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the message we like to give people around here. Hey, we're imperfect people. None of us have things figured out. So if you fit into that category, whether you're here uh, at Darden Campus or joining us online, it is great to have you. My name's Mike, and uh, we're in the middle of a series that we've called Reality Check. Here's why. Because we believe that there's a lot of things going on in our culture that we tend to not have a reality check on. We, we tend to think that, that things like uh, bullying, like we talked about last week, racism this week, and, and drug abuse next week, we tend to think these things are, are not really applicable to us out here in the suburbs. We tend to think these are like, you know, a, an L.A., a New York, a big city kind of thing, but the truth is they are pervasive and they are destructive and they affect every se segment, stratosphere in our society, rich, poor, young, old, black, white, and they particularly are affecting our young people. And that's why we're doing it right now. Yeah. Uh, we're doing it in August because our students are heading back to school. And, uh, and they have a lot that they're facing these days. It's hard for me, uh, Elizabeth mentioned it earlier, hard for me to believe that Ferguson was, uh, was five years ago, right? Um, Michael Brown shooting. Uh, I was actually in, in Lima, Peru. I was on a mission trip at that, that uh, particular time. Went back to the hotel that night, turned on the tube, and saw our beloved city in a very infamous uh, portrayal, right? Uh, black lives versus blue lives, the whole hands up movement, you know, uh, young black males versus white police officers. And, and despite the international attention, uh, despite all the publicity and everything, sadly, uh, not much has changed. Yeah. Have you been paying attention over the, the past couple years? The two, there was just a couple, uh, couple months later down in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. A shooter walked into a church during a prayer service. 
the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, one of our sister churches, uh, a gunman walked in and just opened fire, killing nine African Americans, including the senior pastor who was also just happened to be the state senator mm -hmm. at the time. A couple years later, uh, up the road in Charlottesville was the Unite the Right rally. Uh, let me kind of remind you what that one was. A, a group of people gathered to protest the potential removal of Confederate monuments there in, uh, in Charlottesville. A group of counter-protesters uh, arrived, and so there was clashes. The government ca governor called a state of emergency. The next day, you probably remember this scene, the next day a, a white supremacist uh, got in his car and drove his car into a crowd of protesters, counter-protesters, killed one injured 19 and then just a couple weeks ago right so it's, it's not just a black and white thing uh, racism uh, transcends uh, all the races uh, down in in El Paso again uh, a self-identified white supremacist walks into a, a Walmart opens fire kills 22 injures dozens uh, he identified as a white supremacist allegedly has a manifesto that he put on the the web before he went and did this he named Latino immigrants as invaders into mm. Texas who could only be stopped with deadly mm. force now uh, I don't know about you but I, I, I would have thought our country yeah. would have learned a few things that we would have come a, a, a little bit further in in the world but it appears as if this isn't stopping. Uh, I mean, every day we turn on the news, we hear something else. And whether it's bullying or, you know, racism, a lot of hate out there, a lot of violence. And, and this is not the way that we are called to solve our issues. Um, if you want a reality check, let's just look at this. Uh, statistics tell us that hate crimes are motivated by race more than anything else. And in fact, up to 50%. The FBI puts the exact number at 47% mm -hmm. of all uh, hate crimes, all types of hate crimes, 47% are racially motivated. Uh, furthermore, there are active hate groups in every single state. I mean, it, it's hard to think about some of these little states. Everything seems right. so nice in their hate groups. Ku Klux Klan, Aryan Nation, uh, the main agenda is white, suprem white supremacy. And, uh, and, and here's the saddest statistic. The number of people who belong to these groups hasn't gone down mm -hmm. since segregation supposedly ended 50 mm -hmm. years ago. Right. There's, as, there's as many people in, in hate groups now as there mm -hmm. was 50 years ago. I think we need to change. Amen. What do you think? Yeah. Do you think we need to change? Yeah, a reality yeah. check. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good segue for uh, tonight's musical guest, uh, all the way from the city of St. Louis. This is Vance Watts' mother, <laughs> Gloria Jean Van. And you're in for a treat yes, as are. she brings her rendition of Sam Cooke's song, A Change Is Gonna Come. Morning Star, give it up give for her Gloria a good Jean. Welcome. Die. 
change is gonna come. Yes, it will. If you believe it, say yes, it will. If you believe it, say yes, it will. Hey, Vance, thanks a lot for being here and, and being willing to share this. When we were in uh, in our team meeting several weeks ago and you shared it, man, it just kind of kind of gave me a double take. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. All right, so pretty much uh, our family, we love to go to the movie theater, so we go pretty often. Uh, this one particular night, um, we were rushing to get there, it was a long day. Um, so we usually go in as a family, but I sent the kids on in to get the seats, and I said, I'll wait behind this time, and I'll get the popcorn and everything for everybody. Um, as I'm getting the popcorn and uh, filling up our drinks, they're texting me like crazy. I'm like, why are the kids texting me? They're in the movie, they, what are they texting me for? So I'm really ignoring the whole thing. Right. So I just went ahead and stopped what I was doing, uh, figuring maybe it's something, just in case it was something serious. So I go in there to, to find out that there was an older gentleman. He was sitting in their seats, uh, pretty much, and he was harassing them, selling them. So you had bought seats ahead of time, assigned right. tickets, seat number, mm -hmm. these are your seats. Right, that's how uh, the theaters that we go to, we normally order them in advance. Um, so he's actually sitting in our seats, and he knows he's sitting in the wrong seats, but he's telling my sons that they need to go and get the management. And by the time I got there, the gentleman was gone, so I'm like, all right, so is everything okay? It's good now? And they were just telling me, and they were a little shook up or what it, about it or whatnot. Um, so we just went ahead and said, I'm like, all right, well, maybe we should leave just in case he went to get a gun or something. You know, all this crazy stuff is happening. But I'm like, well, let me just go ahead and sit down and enjoy this uh, this movie. So as we're sitting there, the movie's uh, coming on, first scene's happening, uh, here comes the older uh, white gentleman and a staff from the movie theater, and the police were, were with them. And so he went and got the police. And I didn't, I wasn't necessarily putting two and two together as it was happening until they went all the way around and walked uh, to my son. So, so I'm seeing this, I'm like, man, what is going on? Why are they approaching my kids in the movie theater? So I just went down there to see what was going on, and there it was with the same gentleman being, um, I want to say irate, I guess just being a nice, putting it nicely or whatever, but, and I'm uh, watching the movie theater's first person's reaction and the police officer's action. I'm like, hey, what's going on here? What, is, what are you guys talking to my son about? Why is this guy gesturing and doing all these different things? They ended up telling him that, hey, those were our seats and um, they, we had the right to sit there or whatnot. Um, and they kind of sorted it out. But at that point, I'm like, wait a minute, there's a disturbance going on. I'm not sure that we're comfortable being here with this gentleman who's uh, been harassing my kids this whole time. And then, so I talked to the uh, police officer. I said, hey, I want to actually file a complaint so that we can, um, so we can have this on file and, uh, yeah, file a report or whatnot. And at this point, I'm talking to the police officer, and he's just a uh, brick wall. Like, well, no crimes committed, so we can't uh, do anything. I'm like, but I can file a complaint for a disturbance, though, right? Uh, well, he just kept giving me all of these these excuses <laughs> or, what, or why we couldn't file a report and why he didn't want to get involved in it. Um, but at the same time, I'm asking, so we can get the police called to come and talk to my kids who are minors uh, for watching the Avengers movie, but I can't file a complaint against the person that um, is in here harassing my kids. We both know there's probably a lot of people out there that are like, yeah, uh, come on. This is this is probably some isolated incident, and are we just blowing this up? Or what would you want folks like me who don't grow up with this reality, who really are are, are kind of uh, isolated from? What what would you want us to know? Uh, just hear the stories. It happens every day, so it's not necessarily a conversation that just would come up. It's just a regular occurrence that happens, and um, and you will see it on the TV. Um, and you would automatically think, oh, well, now nah, she shot him for a reason. He had to be doing something because that's the officer and that's how it, it goes. But really just listen to the, to the stories. Wow. Um, most of us hear that, that kind of story and, and listen to all the stuff uh, about Ferguson and Charleston, Charlottesville, El Paso, and, and we kind of cringe. We're, we're kind of ashamed and we're kind of embarrassed that those kind of things still happen uh, in our nation, if not in our own backyard. Uh, most of us feel as if we've kind of evolved, uh, at least personally, individually, 
right? We've got the education we need. We've been to the seminars. We look at people uh, differently than our grandparents did. And we remember going to our grandparents' house and, and them saying things that kind of made us cringe. And, and when our friends send us a, a, an email or tell a joke with racial implications, we kind of tend to balk at that. And, and yet the truth is, uh, there are some biases that, that lie deep within each of us. Uh, I'm, I'm becoming more and more aware of those uh, myself. And consider uh, just the last week, uh, right out here in our own backyard, I had a family who's been attending Morningstar, uh, African-American family, been, been attending the last few weeks, and, and they emailed me just last week, and, and they asked the question, Pastor, um, we, we, we had been attending a church in the area, a predominantly white church, and quite honestly, we felt kind of pushed out to the side, ostracized. And, and we're just, we just want to ask before we you know, get too involved here, what can we expect at Morningstar? And uh, I thanked them. I said, hey, I, I just, it's great for the courage that you had just to put yourself out there after that kind of experience, to just put yourself out there and give, us, uh, give church another try. Thanks for coming to Morningstar. Uh, and, and I ended by, by saying this, uh, so while I can't guarantee, we can't do that, how every person is going to behave toward any other person in our church, would like to, but we can't control others, I do promise that we are committed to being an inclusive church in every way, socially, economically, racially, you will be treated by our staff and leaders with the same level of acceptance, love, and respect as any other person in our congregation. And I hope that, that all of us who call Morningstar Church our home would, would agree and commit to Amen. that, right? Amen. Um, so, um, man, t t now's, the, uh, now's the other really great time of right. the show. Uh, we're going to introduce tonight's special guest. Uh, this is one of Morningstar's own students, yeah. uh, senior at Fort Zumalt uh, West High School, right over on Bryan in Mexico. Give it up, Morningstar, for Vanessa Onaha. Yes. Get in here. <laughs> There she is. Yep. All right, Vanessa. Great to see you great again. To see you. How you doing? Good. Did you have a good Saturday night? I, I did. It was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. You were here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks for your time. Appreciate Anytime. it. Your Anytime. situation um, is unique. Tell us a little bit about your situation growing up. As Pastor Mike said, my name is Vanessa. I'm a senior at West. Um, I'm on the student leadership team here, and I also serve in children's ministry in the K to three room. In regards to my race, I am biracial. My mom is white and my dad is black. I've grown up in O'Fallon my whole entire life. I was actually homeschooled until high school and now attend West. And you, you, you have an interesting comment about O'Fallon and homeschool. So <laughs> O'Fallon is very white, as we all know, it's true. But the homeschool community is so much whiter. <laughs> and I had a great education. There was just no diversity whatsoever. Right. You brought some color to the homeschool world. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for that. Tim Hawkins has a lot of jokes about that. So you you got you to connect mm -hmm. with him. Um, hey, how has it been for you? Uh, how has it been when you are with your different friend groups, and, and I know groups, cliques tend to form, so I know we've talked, you have a group of, you know, white friends and a group of black friends, and sometimes you're just together. Um, what's different when you're with each of those groups? Um, I always say that I am too white for my black friends and too black for my white friends, mm -hmm. and <laughs> what I mean by that is that when I'm with my black friends, I think a lot of it has to do with stereotypes, both stereotypes that I put there and that they put there in the world puts their society, but just like... I know I, my parents are separated, so I've grown up with my mom, who's white, and I'm in the top of my class. I speak with very good grammar, and there's like a lot of stereotypes surrounding black people about how they can't speak very well, or they can't even read very well, which is so not true, but mm. there's just a lot of uh, societal stereotypes that are there between me and my black friends that make me feel like I'm not quite in with them, like I'm a little bit of an outsider. Whereas when I hang with my white friends, they just don't understand a lot of what I've had to go through growing up being biracial in this white city. Like, I remember I was at a church conference with youth um, in last December, and I looked around, we were in the conference room, maybe a couple thousand people there, and I was looking around, and I saw maybe three other black people, mm -hmm. which, like, isn't, like, that's always happening <laughs> wherever I go. I'm always looking around, and there's never anyone who looks like me, or maybe a couple people. I mean, I stand out no matter where I go. I have an afro, and I'm almost six feet tall. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, <just Yeah. laughs> but as far as skin color and just people who understand what I've had to go through, they just, my white friends just don't get that. Or like, 
we'll pass a Confederate flag and that'll put me on edge, it'll make me a little uneasy and right. they just don't understand like what I have to think about and what I go through on a daily right. basis. Are those uh, conversations then that you get to have with them or are they pretty standoffish? Are they open to those conversations? Yes, I try to explain it because I think we should all grow from differences and I would love to like, you know, I want to hear about their life, I want them to hear about mine, but it's just, so they're open to hearing about it, it's just they don't quite understand it in the way I would like them to. Sure, yeah. sure. And you know, we've only been in this battle. I, I, we saw this Show Me Democracy film that we're um, going to show. And, and it's interesting that we've had, you know, a couple hundred years of real racial division. And, and we've only really started to do something about it about 40 or 50 years ago. We've got a long way still yeah. to go to, sure. to overcome. But uh, when, when, you're with, uh, when you're with your peers, uh, you said that sometimes things get said. Very unintentionally, they, you love them, they love yeah. you, and they say things, and it's like, oh, can you, can you share? Because maybe some of us can learn from that. Yes. I think one of the things I get most often, which is not anyone necessarily trying to be racist, they're just mm -hmm. insensitive, they're not thinking before they speak, is that they'll say, oh, you're not really black, or oh, I forgot you were black, which to me, I take very offensive because mm -hmm. my, my grandparents on my dad's side are both incredible people, they came right. from nothing, and they have this great family now and I just love that heritage and I love that part of me. Right. So when people tell me that I'm not really black or like they forgot I was black, that's like taking away part of my identity and I feel like I'm majorly disrespecting and dishonoring my grandparents mm -hmm. and my grandpa actually passed away two years ago and he mm -hmm. was the human embodiment of love mm -hmm. and I want to do everything I can to continue on his legacy and part of that legacy is he was an immigrant from Nigeria so when people tell me that I'm not really black, that's right. dishonoring him and that's tell that's like cutting a line through through mm -hmm. our connection which I would never want to do I would never want to disrespect my grandfather so right. when people say stuff like that to me it's like they're not really seeing me they're like you know not including part of my identity mm -hmm. um, another thing I get a lot like the other day there was like a rap song on and one of my friends was like oh Vanessa why don't you stand up and li like this song you know you're black you should like rap music and I was like <laughs> no <laughs> um, <laughs> One of my favorite authors, Shimananda Adichie, she said, stereotypes are not incorrect, just incomplete. And I love that because, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a stereotype that black people only listen to rap music. And it's true, like a lot of rappers are black, but that doesn't mean that only black people listen to it. And it doesn't mean that only white people listen to like, country music. Like that's just not how it works. So uh, people need to understand that, understand that you can't put people in such a small box and have every person of a huge racial group just do one thing, we're all different. Um, even though we may like have the same skin tone, doesn't mean we all think the same or believe the same. So that's a really big thing. And the last thing I want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that is a big pet peeve from mine is when people talk about my hair, or I'll just be having a conversation with someone, and then someone will come up to me and then start touching my hair which is a huge invasion of privacy. Yeah. Um, it's been going on my whole entire <laughs> life. But like, <laughs> like, it's funny, but I'm just like having a personal conversation with someone and then they just start coming up to me and touching me. I mean, yeah. it, like, it's just like if I did that to you, right. you wouldn't be happy. I'd probably be in jail. So <laughs> like, that's a huge invasion of privacy yeah. or just my hair in general. Growing up, I cut most of it off, but I used to be about twice as big and it's super poofy, it's super frizzy, and people would say that all the time. They'd be like, oh my gosh, your hair is so poofy. I know, but when I was younger, that's the last thing I wanted to hear, because I just wanted to fit in with all my Caucasian friends. You know, yeah. I, the only people who looked like me were my sisters, so I wanted pin straight hair. I would spend hours and hundreds of dollars, you know, getting my hair to match theirs. So when people would say stuff like, oh, your hair is so frizzy, I would take that extremely personal. And now I've grown to love it, and I've Good. learned to accept it as a part of my identity. But Good, for you. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. What would uh, what would you want uh, us to know? Your your peers, the adults in this room. What would you want us to know? You've got a captive audience, and you've already won us over, Vanessa. That's right. So uh, <laughs> we're we're on the edge of our seat. We will listen. I think a big thing, something I get a lot, or like when people are trying to be culturally sensitive, they'll be like, "I'm not racist. I'm colorblind." Well, if you're not seeing my race, then you're not seeing me at all. That's right. And when God calls us to be the body of Christ, and when he calls us to be united by his love, 
He calls us to not just get rid of our differences and to all be the same, but to have differences and to learn about them and to grow from them and to celebrate them, not just to pretend they don't exist. And when you're saying you're colorblind, that's pretending that those differences don't exist at all. So we have to learn about them and we have to grow from them and we have to accept that we're all different and love one another anyway, for sure. That is Excellent. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Vanessa, thank you so much for your time and uh, I'll you. see you next service, okay? Yeah. Give it up. Uh, give it up. Now, if y'all would just rather hear Vanessa preach next week, say amen. amen. <laughs> Join us for a special show. <laughs> what? Sorry. <laughs> How quickly they turn on you. She's already gotten more applause in 30 Absolute, seconds than I've gotten in the last 40 They didn't flash the sign, brother. Yeah, right. No. Yeah. How do you know? Join us for a special showing of local filmmaker Dan Paris's newest film, Show Me Democracy, this Wednesday night beginning at 6.30 p.m. The film traces the history of racism in our city, giving new insights to how we got here and where we can go from here. The movie starts at 6.30 on Wednesday night in the venue right here at Morningstar Church. We'll see you there. In addition to this, check your bulletin for two additional resources for you to consider. The first is the Implicit Bias Test website, where you can test your own bias score. And also in your bulletin, you'll find the information on the book, What Fragility? Why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. This is a great read that offers an unflinching approach to answering those questions on social justice that most people are afraid to ask. That's great. I'm so glad that we're offering these next steps for people. We've done that implicit bias test. Right. And uh, I, I, I've got a little room still yeah, to grow. I, I actually answered the questions like Pastor Jennifer would. Right. And I still off the chart. Well, yeah. Off the chart, yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, Hey, we're, uh, we're doing these topics, and uh, what, we, what we're, we're doing is we're looking at culture, we're looking at statistics, uh, we're also looking at what some people who've, you know, got some experience, some personal, some skin in the game, if, if, if you will, but ultimately, as people of faith, we are called to look at Scripture, and what does Scripture have to say about these issues, and, and the problem is we, we tend to look other places when it comes to these kind of reality check issues. When it comes to race, we tend to, to look at what our parents embrace or run counter, totally counter to our parents' ideologies, right? And their thoughts on race. We look to, to pundits on TV like Sean Hannity on Fox News or, or Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. We tend to forget about guys like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We tend to forget about apostles like Peter and James and Paul. Surprisingly, the authors of the Bible had a lot to say about the issue of racism. In fact, one of the biggest issues to confront the early church was racially motivated. Now, you'll remember that Jesus was Jewish, right? You'll remember that Jesus' original 12 disciples were Jewish. Almost everybody who began to follow Jesus early in his ministry was Jewish, but as the gospel began to spread outward from Jerusalem. More and more non-Jews, more and more Gentiles began to hear the good news and put their hope and trust in Jesus. Now, this presented a, a, a conflict for the leaders of the Christian church, Peter and James in, in particular in Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and, the, and the clash was when Paul was converted to Christianity, he began to, to go into the Gentile worlds and preach to the Gentiles, and many were coming to faith. And Peter and James wanted the, the Gentiles to become Jewish before they became Christian. In, in, in terms of adopting the laws, that in other words, men would be circumcised, they would follow the, the Ten Commandments, the 600 plus other laws that Moses wrote, that if you were a Gentile, you would become a Jew in order to become a Christian. Now Paul said, no, 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 that doesn't, that doesn't have to happen. After his conversion, and, and listen, remember Paul. Paul in his, the first part of his life was a Jewish Pharisee. Uh, out of all the disciples, there was no one who would have known and been more committed to the law than Paul. But following his conversion, he spent a few years out in the wilderness, really trying to understand this, this Jesus and the call that Jesus had on his life. And he came back fully convinced that it was only by grace that we have been saved, only by what God had done in Jesus Christ, not by the law. And so 
Paul was kind of against James in particular. Peter kind of waffled in the middle. And, and so for several years, the church debated this issue, and ultimately they prayed and came to the same conclusion that Paul did, that Gentiles did not have to become Jewish in order to become Christians. And, and today we're going to take a look at several kind of keystone verses from the Apostle Paul that I think go to the heart of this issue of racism even for us today. We're going to start with uh, Titus 3. Paul writes, God saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Now, pay attention to these next words. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying here is that we've been saved not by our works. We've been saved from what God's done for us. He washes us, think baptism, gives us new life by his spirit. Not because of what we've done, but because of this gift. And so I'm going to teach you what the Bible says is God's remedy to racism, what is totally different than the world will teach you. That it's about education, or it's about government, or it's about money, or marches. The truth is, the Bible teaches that God's remedy is that he begins by giving us a new heart. No amount of money has ever fixed racism. No march has ever cured it. No amount of media attention. No government action. There's been no policies legislated by Democrats or Republicans, liberals or conservatives. We can't vote out racism. We can't vote in multiculturalism. We've tried to legislate it. Doesn't seem to be making a whole lot of progress. The only way that our sin problem, America's original sin, will ever be cured is if we individually open our hearts and allow God to give us his heart, a new heart. Paul says that ra racial reconciliation begins with spiritual regeneration. That we're washed, we're renewed, we're reborn by the Holy Spirit. God gives us a new heart, his heart, so we can see others through his eyes. We can hear others through his ears. We can act toward others with his hands. So it begins with God. The solution is really a new heart. But you and I know... When we put our trust in Christ, if you're not a Christ follower yet and you make a decision to follow Jesus, God gives you a new heart instantly. But just like if you have a heart transplant, that new heart isn't fully ready to go. You've you got to exercise that heart. And so God gives us a place to exercise that new heart. God gives us a new family. This is God's solution to racism. He gives us individually a new heart and he places us in a new family and you're the new family. The new family of God is called the church. In the church, we're comprised of people of all nations, races, all, all, all economic classes. This is the global church of Jesus Christ, friends. The Bible says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now there is no more Jew or Gentile, slave or free, Male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Listen, 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 listen. The, the cross of Jesus Christ is not just a bridge to get sinful humanity into a perfect heaven with a perfect God. The cross of Jesus is a bridge to do that, but the cross of Jesus is also a sledgehammer that destroys barriers that separate one from another. Look at what Paul says here in Ephesians. For Jesus himself is our peace. He has made the two groups, male, female, black, white, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor. He has made the two groups one, and he has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Friends, this is what happens when we get baptized. We're initiated into God's new family. And in this new family, with a lot of diversity... We begin to meet one and other. Lots of others. People who look differently, think differently, feel differently. And this is our opportunity to grow. To not just live with and tolerate one another. But in the community of the church, we learn to accept, appreciate, respect, and even love 
one another. For any person to think they are above another person, you know what God calls that? Sin. For any person to think or made to be made to feel as if they're inferior to another person, sin. We are all, all of us created in the image of God. We're not created the same. We're created different, but we're created equal, all in the image of God. I love the leadership that our bishop has taken. Just this past week, he, uh, he released a statement in the wake of all the recent racial violence. He said this. He said, for Missouri United Methodists, addressing our own racism is important work and work that will likely never be complete. I love this next line. It is not enough for us to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. The church must take a stand and demonstrate to the world how to love our neighbors in a culture of exponential change and growing alienation and isolation. Friends, the the people of the kingdom of God simply can't be non-racist. Well, well, I didn't, I didn't say that joke. I didn't make that slur. I didn't pass on that comment. I'm not the one perpetrating. I'm not the one doing it. It's not enough to, 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 to not be committing the sins. Sometimes, as we talked about last week, it's the sins of omission, failing to do the right stand. We must be non-racist, which means if we're the people sitting in the movie theater and the, the, the authorities come and there's a white, older white male and a, and a couple young black teenage boys, we don't necessarily give the, the nod to the older white male, thinking, well, he must be right and these young black boys must be in the wrong. That we assess the situation and we take a stand or are willing to get out of our seats and take a stand against injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. So let me give you the challenge today. The challenge is first where it has to begin. It has to begin here. This is God's cure. It's about giving our heart to Jesus. If you've not begun a relationship with him, to say yes today, to begin in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have said yes, there is lots of room for us to continue to grow and make our heart, our hands, our head, our eyes, our mouth more like Jesus. So begin or deepen that relationship. And second, to begin or deepen a relationship with and other someone who is different from you if you're bl black maybe that's a white person if it's wh if you're white maybe that's an Asian or a Hispanic somebody who you work with or is in your neighborhood or somebody that you play recreational soccer with lean in and have a hard conversation open yourself just say hey tell me I'd love to to sit down and have a, a cup of coffee I'd love to sit down and and have a cup of tea you can even sit down Just one. Um, get to know people. We grow one conversation at a time. And remember what James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Let's do it one more time. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Hey, may, maybe this will help. I'm going to close with this. Maybe this will help some of us. Let's remember, this life is a dress rehearsal for eternity and I can tell you brothers and sisters that the kingdom of God up there is gonna look a little bit more colored than in here all right the bride of Jesus Christ is multicolored multiracial multi-ethnic multi-ethnic multi everything in fact this is what John says in Revelation after I look at these things I beheld in great multitude which no one can number of all nations tribes peoples and tongues standing before the throne standing before the lamb the kingdom of God is made up of multi everything red yellow black and white we are all precious in his sight amen so remember if you've been baptized Today, remember your baptism. Today, remember that God has adopted you as a Gentile into his family. He's given you a new heart. He's given you a new place to exercise that heart. And he's called you not simply to sit still.
but to take a stand, to join his fight against evil and racism and injustice and to be a people who will work tirelessly to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace, the fact that you would look upon us as sinners, sinners of every economic class, every racial class, every ethnicity, and you would call us your own. You have created us in your image. We can't wait to see what, what you actually look like, to see you face to face, Father. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for the sin of judging others. Forgive us for the sin of elevating ourselves. God, make us your people. We know a change has got to come, but the only way a change will come is when the church steps up and is the people that you've called us to be. And the only way that the church will ever do that is when each of us individually assume the responsibility that you have placed on us, not just to get us into heaven when we die, but to make sure that we partner with you as our Lord and bring heaven on earth in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you receive that message, it's okay to thank the messenger. Amen. Great message today. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vance, and thank you, Vance's mom. It was Gloria. There she is. Thank you very much. We'd like to invite our ushers to come forward and receive uh, your generosity as God has been so good to us. This is our time to give back to him. Uh, and those of you who are watching online, there's a place where you can give there as well. We are supported wholly by the generosity of the folks uh, here in this room. As the ushers begin to circulate around us, let me just say that today, in case you've been under a rock, today is baptism. And so this is one of the special times uh, in our church. And so I hope that those of you who are tuning in uh, over the internet are being blessed by our service today. I know that we have several grandparents watching. And so they're welcome. We're glad you're here. But I'm, I want to talk to those of you who are in this room and who are watching online uh, th that have never made a decision for yourself for Jesus our Lord. Uh, I want you to know that today could be your day. Listen, if this is the first time that you've ever experienced the love and forgiveness that Christ has for you, well, we would invite you to be baptized. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time, having already received the love and, and forgiveness Christ has, but have never taken the step of baptism. And so I want you to know today could be your day. You say, but wait a minute, I'm not prepared. I don't have anything. Well, we got you covered. In fact, if you look right over here, here is two, two of our great pastors, Shane and Jennifer are right over there. They're willing to meet with you right now. If you're here and feel the Spirit of God moving in your life to be baptized, then I want you, when, when the band begins to sing, I want you to get up and just move right over here to these pastors. We've got shorts for you. We've got t-shirts for you. we got a towel for you. We've removed every excuse that you might have in order not to be baptized yet again here today. We, you can do it. You can be baptized. And for those of you who are viewing through the internet, let me just say, we long for the day that the first time, like, I can't wait, this is going to happen sooner or later, that somebody who's been coming to our church all this time but never been in the room, always viewed through the internet, would be saved there and come here and the first time they'd ever be in the room would be to be baptized in the church, in the family. And so we're, we're looking forward to that day, wherever you are, that we would be able to meet you at that way, all right? So uh, the ushers are done with the business at hand. We're going to invite the band to sing. And uh, if the spirit is moving in your life, we'd invite you just to come up and come right over here.
is the, this is probably the, the, after all the singing, after the great interview, after the worship, this is why we do what we do at Morning Star Church. We are so blessed to have 20 folks being baptized that we know about this weekend, uh, four at this service, uh, maybe more. So uh, those of you who are being baptized, I invite you guys to stand. Parents who are bringing children to be baptized, would you stand? At Morningstar Church, as I said in the message, baptism for us is about initiation into the family of God. And that's why uh, we baptize infants, because they're they're part of a family now. And we have a responsibility as family to help partner with mom and dad and raise up these children to where they put their trust and confidence, their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So I'm going to ask those of you being baptized and those bringing uh, your children... Do you put your whole trust in Jesus Christ? Do you confess your sins? Do you admit your need for the grace of God and ask for the Holy Spirit to help you grow to be a fully devoted follower and help you as parents raise your children to know Jesus? If you will say, by God's grace we will. Awesome. Now, part two. Guys, turn and just turn around. Look at the church family, all right? Because this is, this is not a wedding, but it's kind of like that in which they made a vow, but we make a vow. We make a vow to God on behalf of these fo- folks. Will you, as the church of, of Jesus Christ at Morningstar, will you promise to do everything that you can to provide a place here through your time, through your talents, through your treasure, through your very being? Do you promise to provide a place here where these individuals and their children can hear a dangerous message to die to self and rise to life in Jesus Christ. If you will say, by God's grace, we will. By God's grace, we will. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this day, for this service. We thank you for these individuals who are about to be initiated into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to invite Mitch and Amanda first. Come on up. They're right there. These are the Moeller family with Bryson. And they've been coming for several years. In fact, Pastor Jim, Mike, did their wedding. And now here they are with their first child, Bryson, to be baptized. Oh, Bryson. Hi, buddy. It is so great to meet you. Yes. Yes. And it's... We've got, God's got such a future plan for you, and we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people yeah. welcome Bryson, Off saying amen. amen. Yay. Yay, Bryson. Bless you, so wait, young man. Look, there's a band back there. Bless you, Mom and Dad. Congratulations. All right. Good stuff. Congratulations. That dude's got rhythm. Put him up in the band. Next, we have Brian and Haley Shrimp bringing two kids with them. Owen and Hannah are here today. Come on up, guys. Uh, Brian and Haley are new followers of Jesus, and this is one of their first ways of demonstrating their relationship with Christ. Uh, They came to MSC through an invite from Andrew and Sarah Wilson. 
They're brand new in their walk, and so won't you please welcome them to the family of God at Morningstar Church. This is Brian and Haley Shrimp. Owen, and you have Hannah, or should I say, Hannah has you. <laughs> I, I got to say, this is a first. Um, <laughs> Hannah, I think we're going to be really close. <laughs> the only thing better than uh, being close with mommy and daddy and close to a church is being close to Jesus. We give thanks for your life, and we know that if you have this much love, God is going to do amazing things through you. So, Hannah, I baptize you today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people Amen. said, Amen. Bless you. Now, Hannah, you're going to have to let him go so we can let Owen I could have just there. done that. And I that was good just, stuff, good, man. Yeah. This hey, is Owen. Hi, hi Owen. Great to meet uh, Yeah, not so much, right? It's like, yeah, I know. You Owen's wish, a lot smarter. Owen, we give thanks for your life and for you and Hannah to share such a special day. We baptize you, Owen, today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Way to go, young man. Amen. God bless you. Bless you. Way to go. Congratulations, Mom and Dad. Bless you guys. What a precious family you guys have. Brian and Haley, great job. Thank you, and God bless you. Now we have Libby. Libby Meek is coming up to be baptized. Libby is a, a get this, you probably tell by looking, she's a gymnast. And after she had a bad accident, she noted that the best thing that came from that accident was how her and her family reached up to God. In fact, her best memory of the accident was her daddy praying out loud in the ER. And so here she is today being baptized for the first time because of her personal relationship with Jesus. And I tell you what I'd like to do. From now on, we're going to start a new tradition today. When we have teenagers and and you or and kids being baptized, I'd just like if you're in kids ministry or teen ministry, I'd like you to stand. Just wherever you are, if you volunteer in any of those capacities, just stand. Libby, we are standing in your honor. All the hard work that these folks did were for the one. That's what your t-shirt says. It's about reaching the one. And we did this whole thing so that you might be right there in that font joining this family. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Mike, this is our friend, Libby Meek. Libby, we give thanks for all the people that have poured into your life and your decision to follow Jesus today. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Amen. all God's people said, There it is. 